Good evening, everybody. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. In the name of God, the more compassionate, the more merciful. May God's infinite peace, blessings, and mercy be upon all of you. I would like to thank everybody for joining this evening uh, at the Catholic Muslim Studies Program at Catholic Theological Union. My name is Sayyid Atif Rizwan, and I'm the director of the Catholic Muslim Studies Program. I would like to begin by first thanking um, the, uh, the Bernadine Center for their support and for the marketing at CTU for their support and helping us to put this program together. I would also like to thank the Waraish family for their support that has helped us to put together the programming uh, in the way that we are delivering it today and in the future, inshallah. I would also like to recognize my colleague, Scott Alexander, he, has, he was the director of the Catholic Muslim Studies program for 20 years, and I have uh, taken over at this being my first year. And um, the Catholic Muslim Studies program, and I am uh, very much indebted to his leadership and his guidance, and I hope to be able to uh, take it forward in, 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 as an extension of what he has established here. So, as some of you may be familiar with our programming last year, I started with Scott to develop an arc at focusing on criminal justice reform uh, as, an, as, a, as a very specific expression of social justice issues. And last year, our whole arc was based on criminal justice reform issues and focusing on things that were very specific to this particular problem in our society. We're continuing this year with that arc. And it is with that that I am incredibly humbled to have today uh, as two panelists um, to join us to have a discussion, uh, which I think is very uh, important for what's going on right now. And quite frankly, what has been going on for years here in the US. Uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Suzanne Zohri Chopra. She has a master's in clinical social work from the University of Chicago. Uh, she is a behavioral health therapist at the Chicago Family Health Center. And joining us also is uh, Marguerite Hill. She is the executive director uh, of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, ARC. Uh, ARC. Muslim ARC is a nonprofit organization that focuses on human rights education. Um, and it raises awareness and trains Muslim communities on issues of racial justice. Uh, Marguerite has taught in higher education. She blogs and she has written articles in pop culture media outlets as well. And she received her master's in history of the Middle East and Islamic Africa from Stanford. Now, in terms of the outline, what we will do is we'll first have Marguerite speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, thereafter, we will have Suzanne speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, after that, for about 15 minutes, we will have the two of them respond to the other person's comments. And after that, we will open it up to Q&A. Now, just to let everybody know that's watching um, and, and participating this evening, uh, when you send your question, the questions will come to me, and then I will address them to the panelists. So, Everybody will not be able to see everybody's questions. Only I will be able to see the questions. The other uh, point that I would just like to make you aware of is that if you change your Zoom settings to gallery view, then you will only see the picture or the, or the stream of the person that is speaking rather than the tile view, which shows everybody. Uh, again, that is one way of, um, of setting your Zoom, of you setting up your Zoom uh, stream service. So without that, and I don't want to take up airtime because I am really, like all of you, excited to uh, hear what both Suzanne and Marguerite have to say. So I will turn it over to Marguerite first. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, this topic is um, really central to the work that we do at Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative of um, diving deep into to the process of dehumanization and criminalization of, of uh, 
segments of our population, specifically around anti-Blackness. And so, um, you know, like I'll try to cover 400 years, right, of, of history, um, 400 years of, of, um, of systemic oppression and, and how did that, how, how does that shape our society and its impact? So that's like a big broad topic. But um, I, I think by just kind of honing in on, on some of the key, key frameworks and, and understandings and even like some historical moments can maybe help give us some shape, shape to this discussion. So um, what I hope to do in 15 minutes is, is to, to both like go through some of those like key moments and to provide a framework of understanding the interplay around dominant narratives around um, the pathology, right? That pathologizes um, African people. Um, and, and how is that used to justify policies that in turn have impact that lead to inequitable health outcomes. So we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, and we, we have two pandemics, the pandemic of racism, which has been, you know, has been woven into this country, right? A um, indigenous uh, genocide, anti-Black racism, and, and the xenophobia, right? So, um, and then to, to talk about the, the ways that, briefly, I'll try to talk about the ways that, that Black people in this country have been resilient and, um, you know, and provide some, some, uh, some strategies that we may be able to, to, to manage the current pandemic. So that's a lot. If I'm successful, yay. If I, if I fall short, hopefully, you know, Suzanne can like really push me and challenge me to like get, get to some, some steps that we could take. So um, last year, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones uh, released a project, 1619, um, and it was just such a, a profound uh, work, very provocative, um, and, and got a lot of people to think, um, and including it, it really got me to think, and then in, in that moment, and 1619 were the first Africans that were brought to these shores, in, um, and what did that mean for the society that... Um, proclaimed, you know, like that um, all men are created equal and, and notice we're saying all men. So I'm a woman. So it's like, you know, well, what does that say about our humanity as women? But, but to have that, that, um, that contradiction, right, to, ha to have inequality, to be able to steal Native American land, to be able to exploit African labor, um, then we had to just that ju racism was used to justify that. So 1619 is this groundbreaking moment in, in our country. And um, another provocative statement that um, was brought up to us was from 1619 to COVID-19. And thinking about in that moment, what did it mean to have um, Africans who, who also, whether when they were brought here to the shores, were subject to disproportionate death, whether it was on the slave ships, right, with disease, um, and on plantations, right, whether it's in the Caribbean and in North America. So there's always been discourses on blackness and disease and pathology. And I think that that's, that's really important for, for us to note, but it was actually at that time, it was cheaper just to bring more Africans as, as they died, you know, and what was the cost of that, both for within Africa and the cost within, um, within America, as far as like our own humanity, like as a, as a country. So I'm gonna kind of jump into another, you know, a couple hundred years later and following the, the, the civil war and with the emancipation of Africans. And there became another discourse, right? With now the slave, uh, former slave owners had no, you know, there wasn't any, even in their self-interest to, to maintain the health of, of their property. Like black people were property, not full human beings. And so there was started to be more discourses around black people getting sick. And so you had pandemics at the time, yellow fever, typhoid, um, consumption. You see it always in the movies where people are like coughing up blood. But well, um, former slaves and freed blacks, like they were subject to that. And especially as they migrated in different places and, and were subject to like really inhumane um, 
living conditions and that they were blamed, that there was something to say that they, they were, that doctors um, and, and, and scholars argued, right, that there was something, there was an inherent weakness in, in Black people. Um, and so I think it's important to, to, to make note of this because as we're talking about COVID and when you've seen those early discourses on COVID and Black people and, and the disproportionate rates where they blamed you know, and this is 400 years later, right? They blame Black people for our disproportionate death, as opposed to looking at inequality in the health in the health care system, um, looking at housing, transportation, jobs. What are things that put made Black people more exposed, right, to to the um, to COVID-19? So, we have 400 years of discourses around. Black pathology, um, Black people have been subject to dis uh, disproportionate health outcomes um, through this time. And in the 20th century, right, with, within our, whether we're talking about cancer, um, we were talking about um, maternal mortality, like so for, for Black women giving birth, um, and often the blame, right, is put on, on the victims rather than looking at, at our unequal systems. So kind of shifting from the kind of discussion on Black pathology, um, I wanted to focus some more on, on the trauma of racism, right, and, and its effect, which also like when you talk about intergenerational trauma um, and the violence that Black people were subject, have been subjected to for 400 years. Now there's, there is growing research on the effects of a trauma, post-traumatic stress syndrome on children, right? Like that's, it's intergenerational. It passes on that it, and it affects the coding in our very DNA. And so like we carry that um, and it's not limited by race, but, but the fact that you have portions of our population that are subjected to deep trauma and, you know, consistent lack of justice, right? And consistent lack of access to uh, care and healing. And so that the legacy of, of racist systems, the legacy of racist violence is impacting individuals, right? And that when we start to see that not only is it in our DNA, but it's also in, in the behavior, in the way that we may treat each other, the ways that we internalize white, suprem white supremacy. Um, through that messaging. And I think that that's really important to take, take into account in, in understanding how communities, right, who are su uh, subjected to um, dis disenfranchisement, um, lack of investment, and constantly being targeted by the criminal justice system. One, one thing I think it's important when we think about criminalization of Black people is to think about it going back to slavery, right? That for us to understand the systems that we have in modern day policing, right? Going back to slave patrols, right? And then even during after the, eman uh, the emancipation of Black people, where now there became discourses around Black criminality. And they started to blame Black people who are like, if, if they had been slaves, they were compliant and followed laws. But, um, and this is like, you could find this in Ibram Kendi's work, Stamp from the Beginning, and also um, the book Slavery by Another Name, where um, vagrancy laws came up. And so these became like, if you were Black and you happened to be in a town, or you maybe you didn't have work, they started to arrest Black people and put them in prisons and forced them back on plantations and in mines for unpaid labor. So the discourses around Black criminality were used to actually justify the continual exploitation of Black people and the growing of the modern pr prison system. So I think that that's like very important for us to be, begin to trace the, the, the roots of, of how we criminalize Black communities, how we criminalize specifically whether we talk like Black men and women. And with today with the um, Breonna Taylor, right, the, the, um, with the results of, of how you could see the discourses around that from blaming her, her associations, um, you know, like when, when is it okay for, for Black people to even protect themselves where they're not even safe in their own homes from law enforcement 
or from from other people right like from from people with vigilantism so i think that that's you know like as we think about the the current situation that we're in right now that we have to understand that history we have to be able to identify the narratives that were used to justify the uh disenfranchisement the the ways that black property was taken, the way that Black lives were taken, right, and the continual um, exploitation of Black labor. And, and that when we start to see those, um, those tropes and the narratives and the policies, whether we go from slavery through Jim Crow, and then currently in the 21st century, we have to understand that every generation slave, like that racism morphs into a way that becomes acceptable in the current society. So when the pandemic occurred, um, as Muslim Mark, you know, so as executive director of Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, we were a bit at a loss. We had no idea what was going to occur. Um, we didn't even know, like, was, was racism, anti-racism going to matter at this point because everything was shutting down. And when Dr. Camilla Mutman Rashad from Muslim Wellness Foundation reached out and she's like, well, well, what do you need right now? Or what should we be doing? And, and I told her, I was like, we should be really start organizing to build power because we have no idea as you know, what's going to happen, but you know, there's gonna be some things coming down the pike from these elections, from um, you know, the continual, you know, just, we, we were seeing reports coming from like the National Guard coming out to Los Angeles. So, so when we were invited to, to begin programming, part of that was really addressing the trauma. So our work was to begin to organize from a trauma-based approach, trauma-based community organizing approach. And within a few weeks, the statistics started to come out of the disproportionate deaths of Black people. And we started to think about, there is a, the psychology of pandemics. And so uh, Dr. Camilla Mutman Rashad had, had that book of looking at the psychology of pandemics. And, and what our hope was in building um, the coalition was addressing the emotional state of people, of black people facing COVID. Because we figured if, if you were in a good sense, like your emotional state wasn't well, then you couldn't tap into as much the resilience that you needed from your spiritual, which the spiritual dimensions of addressing these uh, social ills or addressing the pandemics. And then if you didn't have your spiritual state sound and your uh, emotional state sound, then you couldn't make good political decisions. And so we figured we had to have those three approaches to begin to come up with a response to uh, promote wellness within our community. So from the anti-racism approach of, of dealing with the pandemic, of dealing with even the uprising, which we see the uprising as inherently linked to the pandemic, that you have so much um, dissent and dissatisfaction with the, with the current um, society, with not only just the administration, but with all these systems, and that people started to see their own self-interest vested in, in under, you know, looking at look at how much money is going into law enforcement and the criminalization and the targeting of black communities. And what is the possibility if we start to invest in communities that there's so many excuses for why we wouldn't have those investments. And so, you know, like it, from, I would say from Muslim Mark's approach of looking at anti-racism as soul work, which means we have to look within as racism as both a spiritual, disease, right, a spiritual illness that um, is inextricably linked to our emotional state, the ways in which we understand the world and that our actions in the world also are shaped by that and what we see in the world. So these wrongs that we see and that there's something that's inherently wrong in our society when we could use, when we could justify all of the inequality and the suffering without, um, doing anything about it by just blaming people for for all the harm that's being caused so where are we at now i mean we're still in the middle of the pandemic and we're going to see the long-term effects of it 
Um, we're going to see the long term effects in housing, education, transportation, employment, income and wealth, health systems and criminal justice systems. And so our hope is through an anti racism frame that we could be vigilant about um, the narratives that are used to justify the inequality right that we're that that we're likely to see exacerbated by the pandemic. I've seen some of the narratives in Chicago, right, where they're blaming um, rioters, like people who, in, in the uprising, who um, have damaged property and say like, look, they destroyed Chicago. Well, the things that really harm Chicago are not people smashing windows. The things that have harmed Chicago have been the redlining, have been the, the systemic racism, has been the apathy for many years that have justified the inequality, which has led to the rage of people who are now raging against institutions, right? Raging against the, um, the disenfranchisement. And then when we see that people are still saying, blaming people who've been victims of that, um, then we could see that cycle happening. And so what we hope is from an anti-racism framework that we can start to make interruptions we can make interventions within narratives that we can also uh, provide tools and frameworks to help empower people as they work on advocating for themselves and coming together to build power through organizing and establishing institutions for advocacy, litigation, community organizing, and that we could also work to support direct services. And this is why this conversation is so um, important for me and, and I'm just really fascinated and supportive of Suzanne's work, who's providing direct services to those who are directly impacted by racism. So thank you for just letting me have like a little, do a little bit of deep dive into history, into some frameworks. And I look forward to um, all that Susan has to say about, um, about her work in trauma healing. Thank you so much, Marguerite. I really appreciate it. We all really appreciate your uh, comments. I think, you know, when you talk about uh, being a disruptive voice in the tropes that have commonly been dis dispersed, I think that's really important because even with our best intentions, we may be inadvertently uh, perpetuating those tropes. And, and then that in itself then, you know, shapes the way we think about it. And of course, then those are those who are on the receiving end of those tropes and hearing them all the time. And so to be able to disrupt it, I think is a very important step uh, in trying to change the narrative to really understand and uncover just how systemic racism works and how to then be able to uh, develop a anti-racist lens to be able to engage some of these issues that are coming up or that have existed for 400 years. So thank you. So with that now, I'd like to turn it over to Suzanne. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, Bismillah. I wanted to, um, I'm so excited to follow Marguerite's piece, right? Because there are a lot of the um, important, I think, pillars of what she has set up around us in this world that we live in that are really important for us to be able to face. Um, and so I have this really, also really interesting um, responsibility of speaking about these very, very enormous topics, right? And so I'm, I'm pulling in um, and I'm gonna talk about, you know, trauma, um, spirituality, right? Of course, the mental health uh, thread. And so I think, yes, when, when we're talking about trauma, there are some really important and maybe interesting for lack of a better word, uh, dynamics here in Chicago that I think also add to this tone that we're talking about, this acknowledgement, this awareness of really this embedded and manufactured, uh, not, uh, designed injustice, right? That's at the roots of our country. So yeah, there are repeated tropes and statistics used in relation to the violence in Chicago. We're focusing on gun violence, focusing on lack of you know, context, uh, there's a call for mental health treatment, but there's really little follow up. We don't really know what people mean when they say these things. And, and they are just sort of these empty words that we put in, in this performance of, of analysis. Um, so I wanna define these things, right? I wanna take us through this, this conversation, but also really define what we're talking about along the way. And in, in, in the journey to do that as a practitioner, as a mental health clinician, right? I, I have to make sure that we root this, we square ourselves 
um, with the lived experiences, right, with the real issues of access to mental, of to reliable mental health services too, right? So, so I'm going to use Chicago as a bit of a case example. I, you know, I think it's probably going to be important and, you know, for further study, right, being able to see this replicate in, you know, probably many cities and even in rural areas in, in the United States as well. Right, so in, in the city of Chicago about two years ago, there's a research done by Collaborative for Community Wellness, kind of a, a local uh, research group, um, really fantastic clinicians and researchers that were connected to it. Um, and they were really able to sort of zero in on this pretty stark gap of mental health resources and gap uh, uh, of available mental health resources, okay? So it's seeing that in terms of licensed clinic clinical mental health practitioners, right? And if we're talking about trauma, we are generally talking about master's level clinicians. We are generally talking about not, you know, never, it doesn't have to be for your whole life, but at some point being able to access this kind of care, okay? And we see in Oak Park, right? A suburb of Chicago, you know, it's got some relative diversity, some interesting history, very particular to the city of Chicago pretty wealthy, right? Let's say predominantly a wealthy suburb. You're seeing about 4.69 clinicians per thousand residents. That's Oak Park, okay? Near North, right? Very, very wealthy, predominantly white, you know, much less of that diversity, you know, Gold Coast area in Chicago. Uh, you're seeing about 4.45 clinicians per 1,000 residents, okay? So we can sort of understand issues of privilege, socio and economic class. Um, you know, for the Chicagoans on the call, I think there's already some understanding of these areas, right? But in Chicago, we're highly se has segregated. And then of course, like the rest of the country, economically segregated as well. So that's, that's the rate of clinicians that we're seeing in those communities. Uh, there's some violence, you know, there's bar brawls, bar fights, things like that. But when we're talking about predominant kind of gun violence in the city of Chicago, we are looking at pretty much south and west side, southwest side as well. Okay, so the southwest side of Chicago, predominantly Latino, also have really strong roots in the black community as well. Um, you know, predominantly middle, lower class folks, you're seeing a 0.7 rate of clinicians per one thousand residents, right? So the same proportion of residents, but a massive, by a ma I mean, just magnitudes lower in terms of ability to access these kinds of clinicians, right? So I think that just sets up like a very clear picture of the reality of Chicago, not sort of the news or the, the sort of higher level, later level research, but of like the day to day of folks who need to go see a therapist this is the barriers to access that we're talking about. So, um, and actually I should mention, I'll talk about it a little later, but this is also covering a part of the area where the city of Chicago did not close one of the mental health clinics. Okay, and that's still the rate that we're seeing. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, you know, let's, let's start talking a little bit about this trauma, spirituality, right? Because I think it's actually beneficial to really define these things, especially because I'm going to talk a little bit about the mental health stuff. You know, for themes of spirituality, right, there's this great research that was done that sort of, you know, there's so many definitions of spirituality that the main themes in most of the research, I was looking particularly for healthcare providers and healthcare work, but, you know, is, is God transcendent other, right? That's one theme. Transcendent self, right? A theme of this unifying force, right? This integrative energy, something that is able to make this myself whole, this world whole, make things make sense ultimately, right? In a grander sense of the thing, of the world. Hope is another theme right, vital principle, these sort of, this idea that there are principles that are vital to all people. So this, this is spirituality. And in some, in some, for some sort of approaches, spirituality is actually something that is inherent to all human beings, right? And so that, it, that's sort of taking this lens of whether someone has chosen a religious faith to, to have as their home or not, right? There is this spirituality that is inherent in all of us, okay? And so 
if we think about that in terms of how that touches on our mental health, for me, right, as a mental health practitioner, of course, it affects our beliefs about ourselves, our beliefs about others, our beliefs about our future, right? Which for, if you talk to any mental health practitioner, like that's the core of it, is the beliefs about yourself, others, and the future is really a lot of what come, you know, can, can help us understand you and your emotional and mental wellness. And so spirituality is sort of like a thread within all of that. It also can affect your sense, uh, it, it has a relationship to your sense of whether you can control what's happening in your life, whether you can reorganize yourself if you're in some kind of emotional or mental distress. This um, belief in another person's capacity to be there for you, right? All of this is affected by one's spirituality. And so trauma. When we're talking about gun violence in Chicago, when we are talking about lives lost, when we are talking about families being um, broken apart, over policing, um, you know, wearing on the psyche of young black and brown men, right? When we are talking about women who are, you know, uh, fearful of sexual harassment on the street, uh, when we are talking about this kind of trauma, of course, right? Of course it has an effect on our spirituality. Of course it has an effect on our mental health, right? I, I, I say, of course, as sort of a, a person of privilege of education and living in 2020, I think maybe 50 years ago, unfortunately, that might not have been an of course, right? That might, you know, 100 years ago, we might not have been so sort of open to be able to acknowledge that. I think that's, I think in religious traditions, there's a lot of that wisdom, but, you know, we could, again, we could talk about a lot of things, right? But, you know, here and now, we really can acknowledge that, it, of course, it has an impact on our spirituality and our mental health. So let's think about this for a second, okay? So I, I want to share just a, a personal piece here of the wisdom within religions, the wisdom within spirituality, the wisdoms within tradition um, that can really echo some issues around mental wellness, um, you know, for me as a, as a, you know, a Muslim, as a child of Muslims, um, you know, one of the things that my mother always would tell me, and I would be calling her like crying, angry, upset, you know, and she would just say, recite al-Fatiha, right? Which is the opening surah to the Quran, which is the holy book for Muslims. And she would sort of say this in a very plain, instructive way. And I would just, I wouldn't get it. I would be so frustrated, like, no, you gotta hear all of the things I'm upset about and all the things I gotta say. And she would sort of encourage me to have a moment of pause. And it's only until I go to graduate school and years later that I see the wisdom in my mother's words and in that practice, right? That meditative, that centering, that distraction from the what seems to be the biggest problem to something that is bigger than me, right? These are all really amazing mental health strategies. And it was just my mom saying, you know, recite this surah from the Quran. And I think that that also speaks to, and, and something I'll keep even getting to in a larger issue of this generational trauma, because, you know, when we talk about um, communities that have been you know, plagued with violence and lack of resource, you know, communities that have been particularly affected by oppression, we are talking about their interruption of their cultural traditions, of their family stability. We are talking about harm and damage that, you know, is harder to understand outside looking in, right? So I do, as a therapist, see oftentimes the very private way that people struggle with these things, right? The very private way that folks feel this sense of disconnect with themselves, with their identity, because of what is go going on around them. And for very few, but for some even, right, what is going on within. And so, you know, I wanted to share that because I think that we, by looking within ourselves and looking perhaps in our own experiences, see, what we have been able to gain in a sense of stability in our relationships, a sense of trust in others, right? Which trauma particularly can, can damage.
So I want to define trauma for a second here. Because I think what's really important is that we think about trauma, that it tends to involve threats to life or bodily integrity. Okay, and integrity being just like ability to stay whole. So threats to life or bodily integrity or a close personal encounter with violence and death. And so again, right, that when we have our integrity threatened, our ability to stay whole threatened, physically, sexually, emotionally, psychologically, I could go on, right? As a community, as a individual, you know, by nothing other than the nature of my skin color, right, in, the, in this country, if those things are threatened, right, it, it has this spiritual damage as well. It has this psychological damage as well. I do not intend to say that this damage is irreparable. I think, um, you know, Marguerite has talked about in her experience something that is, I think, never to be underestimated, which is the ability to build capacity and power in communities as a response to this oppression, as a response to this harm. So, you know, let's not sort of walk down this path of really digging deep into trauma and forget that, right? So if we think about trauma, right, and this effect, this, this fracturing of an individual, you know, understanding that, I don't want to get too sort of uh, detailed here, but you're going to see the impacts of trauma in someone's uh, arousal level, right? They might be very quick to jump, you know, looking over their shoulders, agitated when you're talking, right? And that, that you might notice. And people sort of name that different things, right? Um, sometimes you hear, what are you, bipolar, right? Um, you know, in the community, you, you hear folks, we talk like that in, in some ways. Uh, what are you, crazy, right? We talk in this very sort of labeling way, but there's really something pretty complex going on underneath. Um, you might, for folks who've experienced trauma, unfortunately, there's going to be a repeating of that in their mind at some level. And so, so that's what we mean when we talk about, particularly, and we'll get to a little bit of this mental health access, but particularly with trauma, it might take you years to open up about that, right? Because the experience that is running through your head is, is quite torturous and you really want to avoid it. Consciously, uh, subconsciously, you know, avoidance is also a really important aspect of the impact of trauma. So it might take you years to reach out. And so let me, let me skip ahead really quick because I, I wanna land in a place that really helps us, one, remind ourselves that if it takes me five or six years, 10 years to talk about trauma that I've gone through and I don't have a therapist any within miles of my home, I don't have resources accessible. I don't have therapists who speak my language, right? Who understand the, you know, the context of the worldview that I have, right? Because, you know, let's be very honest, predominant. Well, let me, let me skip ahead. So, you know, to understand my worldview, right? I need those kind of that quality of help around me, okay? So, you know, we have to really keep into mind, so, so in Chicago, 2012, half the mental health clinics closed. So folks who are experiencing severe and persistent mental illness, you know, oftentimes being able to have, uh, you know, public insurance, access to these mental health clinics, half of them close, okay? What we have seen in Chicago is that predominantly on the west and southwest sides in 2011, so this was a year before these mental health clinics closed and in predominant black neighborhoods, okay? So now I'm talking south and west sides of Chicago. You know, we're talking predominantly black neighborhoods. In those neighborhoods, we're seeing an extremely high proportion of behavioral health hospitalizations. So in the same communities that you do not have reliable, accessible mental health care, you are also seeing a, a stark difference of rate of behavioral health hospitalizations. So that tells me something about the quality of access in terms of supportive services, right? But it also tells me about the way we've intended these gaps to exist, right? That, cert that the, the fuse is lit and let to, to burn for so long until a behavioral health 
hospitalization isn't required. And, and for us who may not be very familiar, a behavioral health hospitalization is not an easy sort of experience like, oh, well, I just had a bad day and they admitted me. No, it is, it is a severe emotional distress, severe psychological distress. So unfortunately, it took a lot for those folks to be admitted. And unfortunately, there is a huge gap before they get there. Right. So where I think is important to really land is, you know, all of this information I'm telling you, I think I hope what I'm trying to tell you is that we're missing something here. We're missing something crucial when it comes to genuine, high quality mental health care. I could talk about a lot of things, but if we think about compassion, right, again, a little, you know, a little free therapy here, you know, compassion is not a purely logical experience, right? It involves multiple things. It involves listening, acknowledging, mutual understanding, and action. And so being able to be compassionate, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a country of racial injustice, being able to be compassionate in a country of economic injustice at the scale that we have it, right, is not a passive process, right? Understanding true and genuine mental health crisis, understanding true and genuine trauma, and understanding the real ways that we can nourish and nurture one another. Not, I don't mean to say therapy is the only option, but let's, you know, that's my, that's my piece to add to this puzzle, right? But something all of us can take on is compassion, right? And so really seeing that compassionate is both a very you know, cognitive, intellectual journey, but it's also a very emotional one, right? And you know, I, I, I hope that we can all sort of take that on and I, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, for everybody that's on the call, you know, as I said, if you would like to ask a question, please just put it in your chat box and fire it off and uh, I'll be getting it and then I can pose it. But before getting into that, um, I wanted to invite Marguerite for any responses that she may have to Suzanne and uh, vice versa, uh, just to get the conversation going. Thank you. Um, wow. I'm, I'm just that was just really powerful to hear um and then you know like i now have like little sparks of of ideas and also just connections that that were made um and something that that came into mind so so part of me is like i i have to do a little bit of sublimation because of you know as as african american it's like and 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 having family members that have faced um mental health crisis and, and even knowing that the type of things I've had to overcome, right, to, to get treatment my own self. And, but stepping away from that and, and seeing, um, like I, I thought about Patrice Kohler's book, which was mm -hmm. so, so powerful, When They Call You a Terrorist. And so her, her encounters were law enforcement, were around her brother who suffered mental illness and how mental illness in black communities can lead to both either death at the hands of police or just co consistent imprisonment. And so um, it's, it's very interesting of seeing the kind of narratives of, of where, whether it's young black children to, to even our elders, right? Like the, that we're not even allowed to say like, you know, in, on multiple levels of, of like, hey, I have mental illness, like I'm not getting treatment or whether, you know, whether they're self-medicating and, and that would go into um, whether the crack epidemic, right? And, and, um, and how that was received, right? There wasn't, they criminalized um, mm -hmm. mental illness. They criminalized people self-medicating. They criminalized marijuana. So, so I think there's so many convergences, right? And, and then when we're able to acknowledge that, hey, not only have a community that's facing trauma because of these things, right? But even in the treatment itself and lack of access can replicate that. So I was, I was wondering, like, from in the Chicago uh, region, like, what are the kind of things that they said around, you know, because I, I mean, I'm also a child of the 80s and 90s. So, so for, for at that time in California, when they were doing the three strikes, you're out law was the idea of super predators, which were the, where they just claimed that one, there was going to be this wave of crack babies that were just going to 
commit a bunch of crimes and not be functional to now you have super predators. So, so that type of thing has like, what are kind of discourses in 21st century Chicago that have used to just justify the lack of treatment, but also, um, you know, maybe separating like or not acknowledging that there, there is a mental health crisis that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, I, I, there, yes, there's like so many things I want to say. And just so the first one that comes to mind is really just like directly to that. I think, the, you know, and, and I am not a native of Chicago. And so it's hard for me. I, some of what I say is sort of like as a transplant, right? My parents immigrated to the suburbs. I, you know, moved into and have lived in the city for about 15 years. Right. And what I have learned of Chicagoans, right, is one, I think for folks who are born and raised in Chicago, I've noticed that they are, they're going to, they're going to vet you. Right. They really want to vet you. And the reason why I think is because I think Chicago is very much a land of dog whistles. I think it's a land of speaking certain language to be able to send signals of either class or race or, or, you know, assumptions or, you know, sort of like beliefs. And I think sort of this coded language, and probably all cities, you know, have this, but, but this coded language of being able to talk about people in certain, certain places, right? And then on the flip side, as a practitioner, I think that, um, and as a therapist that have, has taken upon myself to really try to be in a lot of community organizing spaces and community sort of development spaces, there seems to be this like, uh, race and race is over here, social needs and social services are over here, economic justice is over here, right? This sort of like segmenting of this work that doesn't allow us to see that this is, this is a organized system of oppression that is coordinated on multiple levels, right? So, you know, going to the ED, <laughs> Funding long-term high quality health services is expensive. And we have a very real issue of asking where that money is coming from. I could, for any Chicagoans on here, we could talk a lot about TIF and the way that money has been sort of stolen from the people and guarded in different ways that really hinder development, hinder community investment. Um, because you know, ultimately, I, yeah, this is a dangerous landscape that we're building. Um, and I do wonder about, you know, what are folks who are going to say, oh, we're child, they're children of the 2000s, you know, 2010s, 2020s. I fear what they'll say. But, um, Mar Marguerite, I, I, so one of the things that you were talking about too, you know, this, and you just were, so please, if, if this is something that's too raw, you know, let me know. But, when we're thinking about like criminalization of black people, talking about that generational impact, it really made me think about the, the delicate age of adolescence, right? And um, I, I just wonder sort of what you've thought about that and if you wanna share anything about that, either from sort of a larger lens or even just from a uh, lens of power and sort of you know adolescence and coming into this age of voting, but also, you know, really dealing with and grappling with generational trauma and their own trauma. I don't know, I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, thinking about childhood, growing up and seeing so much injustice and it's being very personal, right? So there's, there's the, um, the experience that even those early encounters um, with um, law enforcement and, and so whether you know like so for me as an individual right like of of knowing um, how my brother was treated um, and, and my mother having to go to police station and, and to make sure that my brother got out you know because he would he would get like we lived we moved to the suburb she she moved us out of a Rust Belt city so I was born in Trenton New Jersey we moved across the country into this into a suburb and Area, but he he would just was pulled over fairly frequently for non-moving violations, um, from like music to tinted windows to just any you know just things mm -hmm. both, um, and and um, and and growing up with that was was a, a distrust for the system, 
right? Like there's a distrust that you believe in justice. So it led to a kind of um, where I saw it within my own, the, within my own self and, and with people in my own community was a type of nihilism. Um, mm-hmm. And so for me, like tapping into, you know, I became Muslim at, at 18. So I was like kind of exploring that. So um, I was still in my teens exploring Islam. So like that helped me overcome some of that nihilism, but it was almost like still separate from, from the system and the understanding, like in- engagement, right? Like it's, um, I think it does a great disservice to, to our youth for them to see that injustice, whether it's happening on the classroom, whether they're seeing like, hey, like if, if, if I'm acting out, right? Like I think that they, you know, young people are able to see straight through truth. They know yep. what's right or wrong, right? And, and so when they see all of this around them, then they could either say like, look, I'm invested in it, or it could just say, you know, if, if I try to overcome all of this, I'm still going to be messed up. And so Rebecca Wilkerson in, in the book cast actually talked about um, how black people, when they assimilate, they go into like their success cases. And because of the many even microaggressions, like they're dealing with like the same genetic trauma, like their, their health outcomes are just as bad, if not worse, if they just stayed within their community. So even Mm -hmm. in the overcome process of navigating predominantly white institutions leads to pain, alienation, and trauma that also needs a particular type of treatment. So our young are kind of like, what do you do? Do you get out of your neighborhood where you know you have these accounts or you try to improve your neighborhood and be faced with some of these challenges? or you try to improve yourself and go this route. And then not only do the people that you're seeking, you know, your coworkers, your peers are going to treat you as less than human, right? And you're still gonna be subject to, just like with my brother, those same over-policing, criminalization, and then, you know, be the last hired, first fired, all of those things, which still lead to cycle of, you know, even in the most successful cases, there still is trauma. So I, I would say yeah. that the the challenge, right, is and 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 what what black people have been really good at, like of tapping into their spiritual traditions, whether that's Muslim. So like I grew up um, Christian, like so the majority of my family members, like we have some Muslims um, in our family, but but faith practices have been yeah. something that have really allowed us to not only tap into like our humanity, but transcendence and belief, like ultimate justice, and even letting go of a lot of like the kind of hatred and resentment um, that would eat us up inside. So, you know, within, within the Muslim tradition, you know, like it's both like there's forgiveness, but there's also this constant struggle. So the struggle is something mm-hmm. that is like, it's not seen as a bad thing it's actually seen as like a good thing. Like you're struggling towards justice, you're struggling towards things. And so making sense of that and being like, well, well, how am I supposed to be in the world um, within like the faith traditions have been key in, in doing that. And, and that's where, you know, hey, you're in Chicago, so you can't really knock the whole like uh, community organizing tradition, the Linsky training, I've had faith-based community organizing. So I mean, I might have some comments about Linsky, but I, I'm pro community organizing. I'm pro community organizing, but it's like, you know, we, it's still, it's like the congregational organizing of, of that faith isn't just like seen as this, um, you know, bomb to like overcome, the, but like that, that people could organize within their congregations towards for justice. So that's yeah. been, you know, a very powerful powerful thing and 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 I also went to my undergraduate is Santa Clara University so I went to a Jesuit school so I was like introduced to liberation Central American liberation theology which actually influences much of my work in in Muslim Muslim art so it's like seeing that um the justice faith inspired justice work where um it's not just about self-interest but it's really about what what does our creator want from us to do like what does our creator want like that compassion right of being yeah. in the world so that that gives a lot of us who are doing faith-based organizing 
a lot of resilience when it does seem like, look, this is so daunting. This is really hard. But the liberation is a way of being, right? It's like, in, yes. it's like we're striving and struggling. And that's beautiful. And then honoring all of those, that 400 years of, you know, struggle when, you know, like one of the last memories that I have, like when my grandmother was still coherent, like, and so she passed away a couple years ago, but one of the last uh, conversations I had with her, she actually, she, so she was, uh, grew up in Georgia and she, her family had to flee the Northern migration because her father got in conflict. Right. And so she, she spoke about when she would walk down the road and she spoke about hiding from groups of white men because she didn't want to get lynched. And so it's just kind of like that. And, and so it's like, that story is so traumatic, but it's like, I draw on her strength yeah. and my great grandfather's strength. And even my mother who, who faced violence from law enforcement, right. You know, like, and, and we, we don't really talk about sexual violence, which that's like right. many generations. Right. And so, so all of that, and, and that really, you know, for even those who, who, may not have a faith tradition, but we're drawing on our ancestors. We're drawing on our real ancestors and whether our fictive people who came before us who model, um, who model the struggle in a way that gives us hope, um, hope that we can be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I think that that's something that is, is very much a part of, you know, even Black Lives, Live, you know, Black Lives Matter movement work where you can see the really, you know, these, these spiritual and these faith traditions and, you know, even in protests of, of circles and holding hands and speaking in, you know, in unison, this, this um, element of really trying to meditate with one another on the strength and power and the resilience of, you know, trying to fight for this kind of change. Um, and, and yes, I think that there are some really amazing you know, churches, mosques, uh, you know, in Chicago that have lived out that organizing, right? And really tried to say, yes, how can we utilize our faith as an agent of change in the here and now? Um, there, I, we could probably have a whole other session all about that. Absolutely. I just want to jump in real quick. So, you know, when we think about the criminal justice system, um, the, what are the, what are the, one of the ways in, in the ways in which systemic racism works is that theoretically the criminal justice system is supposed to be equitable, but practically it's not. And perhaps one of the areas where it comes into sharp focus is in plea bargaining. Um, I don't know if folks know uh, on this phone is that that most criminal cases end in plea bargaining because if every criminal case went to trial, the system would collapse. In fact, statistically speaking, 97% of federal cases go to pre plea bargaining and 94% of state cases go to plea bargaining. And in other words, judges aren't actually prosecuting the case or overseeing the case, prosecutors are. And, and what a 2017 uh, survey showed is that when it came to plea bargaining, when there was no criminal record involved with, uh, with the offender, Folks, offenders that were, white folks were 25% more likely than black Americans to have their charges reduced. And if when it came to misdemeanor cases, 75%, it was more likely for white folks to have the charges reduced or, to, or, or, or not have any prison time uh, carried with the, with the case as compared to black Americans. So it is, it is embedded even in the psychology of the way the criminal justice system is working. And so where we end up now, right now, and um, there's an American philosopher named Erin Kelly, and she has a great book that's called Limits of Blame. And what she writes is that, that the state has become very good, the state meaning at all different levels, meaning the United States of America, we've become very good at legal culpability, like legally showing somebody is guilty. But where we have failed miserably is showing moral culpability. And the moral culpability, and, and the reason we've done that is because we ignore it. We ignore how issues of socioeconomic um, challenges or of, of race, of all these things, contribute to a person's behavior or action. And that disconnect is what lends itself then to adversely contributes and, 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 
and adversely impacts people of color and communities of color. So my question to you guys is, you know, as, as we, we've thoroughly enjoyed the conversations and what you've discussed, how, 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 do we, how do we move forward and how do we in our own lives think about the way in which it's, the, the, to, to think through and to think about how do we change our own lens to think about how the criminal justice system should work that is more in line where legal culpability is in line with moral culpability. Is it things like defunding the police and redirecting funds? You know, there's, there's different ways of talking about that and it's a politically charged issue, but what is behind that? Or mentally, what are we, can, can we do it within our own lens to do it? I mean, there's a, neuro, from a neuroscience standpoint, our brains react before we can even um, have a conscious reaction. We have a subconscious reaction. So inherent sometimes in our brains are a, for all of us, could be a racist reaction. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get behind that to, to get to a conscious place? So that's, those are the two questions I would pose to each, uh, in each, to each of you, and you can answer both or one. And, and just something that we could take away and think about as we leave tonight's session and, you know, this program and, and as we move forward, especially, you know, as we continue to deal with things like what happened with the Breonna Taylor case today, and I'm sure things are going to be coming down the road. Yeah, I mean, can I go, because I'm before, because sometimes like I have an idea and it dissipates and I'm like, what happened to it? It's just like, it was so there because Suzanne is go, go, go. Right, just, like onto the next idea. But I, I think that, you know, from whether it's like from a faith-based approach, um, we have to really rethink legality, right? You know, and that's hard. Like, that's really hard. And, and we have to really get at the core of like, what is it the center of like how we understand crime and punishment? Like, it's revenge. It's not about repairing society. It's like our society, our popular culture, right? You look at movie after, even kids' movies, my favorite movie, Up. What happened to the bad guy? They killed him. You know, it's a little movie for my child. It was like, it's beautiful. The balloons, the love affair, and they killed the bad guy. Just think about like within our own popular culture, how we replicate this kind of revenge thing. You do something bad, you kill the bad guy, right? You put them in jail for life. Like there's, there's not a lot of things on redemption. Even though we, when we do watch a redemption movie, we're like crying, we're like touched by it. We're like, wow, you know, but like usually the redemption movies also really will center around white redemption and not redemption for people of color and not forgiveness for them. So I, I, I think that we have to really think about what what is the purpose, right, of our criminal justice system? And we can look at other models, right, like for why do people, why they put away, you know, like what happens to them. Um, so we, we have to kind of reimagine that and question like why as far as like we have the largest prison population in the world like you know like for like you know when you get the statistics and you could correct me if i'm wrong but it's like we have like 25 percent of the prison population in this country and we're like five percent of the world you know so it's just like that doesn't make any sense and, and think about the cost of it too it's very expensive to have this system and and but our, our country is very punitive in our wars and our things so like we have to really start to think about the human cost of, of our desire to punish and like who are we consider enemies as opposed to thinking about what would it cost to invest in things like mental health for whether our, for our homeless, for our, or those who are unhoused, right? For, for our young people, invest in, in our schools, you know? Like we're, we're not doing that, but we could really invest in punishment because it feels good, right? There's some immediate thing. And so I, I think we have to kind of dig deep. That's why it's really beautiful to see the work of Believers Bailout, of having us re-envision that. And, and the biggest challenge is like for those who are victims of crime, like what type of, what do we want? Justice or restoration of wholeness, right? Like, do we want revenge or do we want wholeness? And so what does that mean? And so I think we, you know, what you're doing at a Catholic Theological Union, like the, it's, it's beautiful to see the, the kind of theological work around justice, because that's the kind of thing, like, I mean, we have to think about, 
you know, we talk about the, the three eyes of racism, institutional, interpersonal, uh, internalized, but not ideological, not the ideologies that, that feed into that. So I'm going to go because it's like my thoughts are now starting to dissipate and I'm just anticipating Suzanne's um, comments now. No, that's really, I love that place that you landed too, because I, I do think it really does come with our, in, you know, our journeys of challenging our understandings and our assumptions, right? And so sort of just from like a healthcare lens, right, uh, exhaustion or workplace fatigue for physicians or providers increases the chance of acting based on bias, right? And so, you know, just from that lens, we can see that I'm sure for a police officer, for a, you know, D, a Department of, you know, um, Human Services in Illinois, like a DHS worker who's approving SNAP benefits, or who, you know, that IDES worker who's looking at your unemployment application, that social security worker who's looking at your social security employment application, you know, in, in income application, right? These people who are interpreting our policies and deciding whether you are admitted into our fragmented social safety net or not, right? All of these individuals are the lifeblood of these policies that we talk about, right? And so, yes, when we know that there is, and, and I'm so glad the way that, you know, say you broke it down, right? Because there, we know that on the other side of that, there continues to be these racial, uh, dispro you know, um, gaps and, and disproportionate impact and harm, right, on, on communities of color, right, and on poor communities. And so, you know, yeah, I think that individual commitment to learning, right, through relationships with institutions like CTU, relationships with spiritual institutions, um, you know, just, I think, relationships with others, um, developing a mutual understanding, um, putting down our phones. Um, I'm such a phone person, but I think that, you know, consuming too much without really participating in mutual understanding building. I'm not anti-technology. I'm just saying if we're using our phones, are we building understanding or are we consuming, right? But yes, those kinds of processes, that kind of journey that we really have to in intentionally set ourselves on with each morning, right, um, is, is certainly something I'd, I'd want to land on as well. Well, thank you so much uh, to the both of you for your time and for your wisdom. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I hope the audience uh, enjoyed the talk as well. Thank you for sticking with us for a little bit beyond eight o'clock. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can't thank you guys, both of you, uh, Suzanne and Marguerite, for, for, you know, sharing what you shared with us.